What got you into writing or wanting to write horror and dark fantasy and the darker side of things? Is there any specific book or writer who got you into it or at an event that got you to say, I want to write this genre? Um, yeah, that's, I'm asked that question a lot. My, my usual answer is uh, I use a, use a saying my grandmother had. It's, it's the way my mum put my hat on. And it's, it's very difficult for me to sort of analyse why I write what I write. And I often, I try not to. I just tend towards the darker side of things um pretty much anything i write ends up i mean 99 percent of what i've written up to now has been horror or fantasy or supernatural and it's all out of fantastical element um i have my first novel published last year called the hunt which was a thriller and that was a straight thriller no um no supernatural undertone or anything but that was based heavily on um i've got into endurance sport over the last few years marathons and iron manners and things so that was sort of heavily based on writing about what i know but as for the dark side of things i don't know i'm, I'm quite a sort of cheerful amenable bloke I, I like to think and i think that's probably because i write i get all the nasty dark stuff down on the page so it helps in that way so who were your favorite authors or books uh, to read when you were when you were growing up? I, I think um, pre-teens I was reading uh, Willard Price adventure books and, you know, kids' books really. And then my mum, when I was uh, 11 or 12, she gave me a copy of The Rats by James Herbert. Uh, I was probably possibly a little bit young for it at, at that stage, but I, I like to say it never did me any harm. Uh, and I never really looked back. I, uh, I started consuming James Herbert books then and Stephen King, Clive Barker, through my early teens. Um, and I, I suppose I was in a bit of a rut reading-wise. Not a rut, but I, I, I just read King after King, reread him and Herbert and Barker. Never really thought to myself until I was 13, 14, or that, you know, there's got to be other great writers out there. And then I started branching out and, you know, um, opened up the whole world of horror, fantasy and sci-fi. And I enjoy, I mean, Stephen King was probably my heaviest influence, I suppose, at a, at a younger age. And I still read, you know, I still read everything he writes now. Um, and Dan Simmons as well. I'm a, I, I love Dan Simmons stuff, his earlier stuff. I've not read so much of his uh, later stuff apart from The Terror, which I think's a modern classic. Uh, so, yeah, and I, I try and read, read more widely now. I mean, I, I read thrillers and... Um, quite a lot of non-fiction now and historical stuff. So on your website, you mention uh, that in your teens, you began about 9 million novels and finished none of them. Yeah. They varied from World War II to action and adventure styles. Could you uh, elaborate on these? So these are stories that you were writing that you never finished. Have these stories ever influenced things you've written since, or have they just been hidden away? Um, I don't think I've got any of them left hanging around. Uh, they were, I, I wrote, like military thrillers in my teens and disaster books, disaster stories, uh, action, th action thrillers. And I not actually not that much horror or sort of supernatural stuff in my teens. It was probably 1920 when I wrote my first horror story, actually, that was called black heart. And I've probably still got that somewhere buried away in the attic, never to be seen again, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've I've enjoyed writing since I was pre-teens. I mean, I I'd write stories when I was six or seven and uh, read read voraciously at that uh, sort of the age nine, ten, eleven. I'd read a book a day and help at the local library. Uh, but I, I think I was I was sort of finding my feet through my teens. I was I was writing quite a lot, but sort of flailing a little bit and not really falling in love with any particular type of writing or fiction which you know as it is as it should be really and i think i found i found my sort of niche in my in my early 20s when i started writing and submitting a lot of short stories um and it wasn't until it was sort of mid-20s when i started getting published really so the first published story that you have is a uh, um psychotrope in 1994 then your first novel was was mesmer in 97 yeah uh, why don't you talk uh, talk us through the process of when you first got your first story published? 
what were you thinking when you sent it in, and what was your reaction when you finally got the letter back that says, yes, this is going to be published, we're going to put it on? Yeah, well, I remember my first acceptance was actually via phone from uh, Stuart Hughes at Peeping Tom magazine, and I remember that vividly. It was probably 20 years ago now. Uh, yeah, it was probably 20 years ago when that was my first acceptance. My first published story was, as you say, in Psychotrope. Simon Says, I think that story was called. Uh, but my first acceptance was um, first taste. And I remember I was living, I just moved in with my girlfriend, now my wife. And my mum phoned and said, there's an editor on the phone for you. He's going to phone you now. So I said, put the phone down, mum, in case it's engaged. So I hung up and, and Stuart phoned and uh, accepted my story. And, and I thought, and I was, I must have been 23 then. And I just thought, right, that's it. I'm going to be a writer. Um but as these things happen, you know, I think I was paid two pounds fifty for that story, and and I spent years after that writing more stories for these small press magazines and getting published in bigger venues. And then Mesmer, as you say, the first novel came along. Mesmer, um, I think I was probably paid two hundred pounds for Mesmer. And then you know you you get the because uh, I was in, I was working full time then and did for years afterwards until I sort of built up more of a head of steam. Um, and my work colleagues, as soon as Mesmer was accepted, they they said, oh, you're going to quit work now then and buy a mansion and be a writer. And as you know, it's very much not like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they, they were exciting times and I have vivid memories of, of the, the initial acceptances. And I know uh, you became a, I believe, a full-time writer in the, late, in the mid to late 2000s. Yeah. Um, what were you doing in the meantime, because I know we've had a lot of authors on some of them, you know, like we, uh, like Paul Kemp is, you know, a lawyer. We've had, you know, a lot of them have other jobs. What were you doing in the meantime to help make things, you know, survive, eat food? Yeah, well, I I left school at 18 and became a building surveyor. Um, and I kept that job for, and, until I quit and went full-time writing. Um, I worked for, first couple of years, I worked for a building company and then, I went to a local authority, local council, and worked. I was with them for 20 years. Uh, and I, before I went full time, which was almost 10 years ago now, I was I went part time for about four years. And I was I was quite lucky working at the council because my my boss was one of my best mates, and he knew exactly what I wanted to do. So um, the the couple of times I asked him, I went into his office and closed the door for a meeting. He knew that I was asking to go part time, and then you know handing in my resignation to to take a stab stab at writing full time so um it wasn't it wasn't a job towards the end of my time there it wasn't a job that i enjoyed that much because my heart was in writing and i was getting a bit more success here and there and more importantly for you know keeping a roof over our heads i was getting paid a bit more money for for books so it all sort of came to a, a head and i said to my wife i, I need to really just make a go of this. I'd, I'd been in the same job for a long time, and I had a lot of friends there, and I didn't, I didn't mind working there. I quite, quite I enjoyed the the environment, um, but it was definitely the right move. Taking, you know, taking a leap. It was shocking. The the end of the first month as a full time writer, I didn't get a salary, and that was <laughs> first time in my life I'd not had a paycheck at the end of the month. That was a bit scary. So now we're going to delve into some of your some of your books because we have well quite a few listener questions. We'll see if we can okay. touch on as many of as possible. So the first one is, um, you've written the movie novelization and one of the sequels to the Steve Niles uh, comic book miniseries Thirty Days of Night. I just want to know how did you first get involved with Thirty Days of Night, and do you have any association with Steve Niles and IDW, the people who published a comic, as you continue writing books uh, into that series from here on out? Um. No, I've got no, uh, I never had much contact with Steve, I think apart from a couple of Facebook messages here and there. Um, I was I was approached by, uh, I think I wrote it for Simon & Schuster from memory, um, the editor there asked me to do the novelization and I did that and it went down pretty well and I, um, I'm pretty sure that one hit the New York Times list, the 30 Days of Night novelization, which is purely down to the title of the book and not the person that wrote it obviously um but it did so well that they were doing some standalone novels and ed my editor at the time ed schlesinger wanted me to write um one set in london which became fear of the dark and that uh that really 
it is a 30 days of night novel because it has some sort of characters that appear in in the comics and the movie that appear in the book but it's it's more really my london vampire book it's a tim levin vampire novel which happens to also be a 30 days of night book and and it's just those two that i've done actually i've not done anything else since but they were good fun and uh, that was my first first stab at a novelization and I, I really enjoyed it it was good fun to do it's a different process you know because you sent a script and set, and you're told turn this into a novel so um so you don't have you don't have the complexity of working out the story because it's all there for you but you also want to delve deeper into character you know into the character's motivations and things like that really it's good fun so when you get sent a script how much freedom do you have to be able to do add or elaborate on points because you know scripts talk about some actions and shots and you know what people are seeing and what they're saying but they don't necessarily go into motivations they don't necessarily delve into their head so mm -hmm. how how much freedom do you have to be able to expand and elaborate on points in the script that work better on the page than they do on the screen um with 30 days of night i made the mistake of because it was the first novelization i'd done i probably should have pinned down exactly what my parameters were because when I delivered the book my editor was really pleased with it really pleased with what I'd done I'd expanded some of the uh, character stuff and added scenes and I'll talk about one of those added scenes in a minute and then a few days after he accepted it he sort of came back and said oh you've changed some of the dialogue it'll have to all go back in so <laughs> you know I shouldn't have uh, some of the dialogue that works on the screen I didn't think worked in the novel particularly well so I changed some of it and expanded it cut out certain lines and that all needed to go back in. But I did add a scene which I thought just would have been perfect for the movie. And it was when a polar bear wanders into Barrow, where the, where the movie's set, and the vampires stalk it and sort of play with it and like a, like a cat plays with a mouse. And the polar bear, you know, the, the most powerful land predator we've got, gets taken down by a couple of vampires. And I just so thought that would have made such a cool scene in the movie. But they didn't do it, obviously, because I was writing from the shooting script. Yeah, that that would actually be a pretty awesome thing. Because, you know, the only thing that drove me nuts about the movie of 30 Days a Night is I'm from Alaska, and I know what Barrow's like. Yeah. <laughs> There's no trees up there. No, no. There's mountains I... up there. It's pretty bare. But, of course, some of the things they have to add, because no one really wants a dark town in the middle of ice mm. and low grass. <laughs> but... <laughs> But you mentioned something really interesting. You said um, how when you wrote your 30 Days a Night, the sequel novel, how it's a, a, Tim, a Tim Levin vampire novel just happens to be in 30 Days a Night. Is that the uh, stance you take when you write in the franchises? Like you've written in um, you know, Alien, you've written in Star Wars, you've written in Predator, I believe. Mm. Um, you've written in these other franchises. Is that the aspect, that the, the side that you take? You write your own novel, but it just happens to be in that universe? Yeah, that's... In my head, I mean, unless I'm doing a novelization, which it's which we've just talked about, you very, you know, the story's confined because it's there before you anyway, before you start. But the attraction for me doing Star Wars, I'm a Star Wars fan, obviously. I'm a massive Alien fan. And, you know, I like Predator. So the attraction doing new novels set in those universes to put my stamp on it, really. Um, with, with the first Alien novel I did, I, I, I was given like the story outlined by Fox and that that meant I had to write a Ripley novel and it was set between Alien and Aliens pretty much the rest of it was down to me so I had to incorporate Ripley which as you can understand is quite difficult between the first two movies um because she doesn't <laughs> when she wakes up in Aliens she doesn't remember anything happening after Alien so you know that that was a bit of a poser for me but especially with Star Wars I think I um because I was approached to write a Star Wars novel and the one I wrote was 25,000 years before um, A New Hope, you know, the original Star Wars film. And it was the earliest novel in the Star Wars timeline. And they wanted it, they wanted it to have the feel more of a sort of a sword and sorcery uh, story as opposed to, I mean, Star Wars is all fantasy anyway. It's not really sci-fi, but they, they wanted it to feel more like a bit of, you know, a bit more heroic fantasy set in space. Um, and I just had an absolute ball writing that book because it, it was... I had to bear in mind it was a Star Wars book and I had to, uh, I was writing it set in the same timeline as a series of comics, Dawn of the Jedi comics that were out at the time. Um, but it was just, it was my, my space opera fantasy novel that happened to be in the Star Wars universe. 
And the same as the alien predator stuff I'm doing now. I'm doing a trilogy called The Rage War for Titan. And that's uh, my big um, space opera, my, my big space military story that involves aliens and predators. And obviously, you know, the alien universe is pretty um, is diverse, but it's also been, you know, there's lots of various things that go on in the alien universe. There's the games and the comics and, and the books and the movies. Um, but Fox told me, we, you know, just, just the movies are canon, really, and the previous novels, and that's it. So I only have to follow them. I'm going to ask some questions about uh, Dawn of the Jedi because, you know, you mentioned this is the the novel that came play. It's the furthest written back we've ever seen. Yeah. And even if, you know, we even know they've technically wiped the canon, it's still so far back that I doubt we'll ever see anything like this anytime soon. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. So uh, you said they approached you for this story. Um, did they already have the the whole story outline of what they wanted to be told and what we're trying to find an author? Or did they have an idea and they wanted to find an author who can expand on it and make and, and, and make this book. How much input did you have into creating uh, Dawn of the Jedi into the Void? Um, I had a lot of input, really. They, they, they approached me to write a novel set in that era. They didn't have a particular story that they wanted to tell. They just wanted to write a novel set in, um, I'm trying to think, it's a few years back, the Tython system, which is um, where the Dawn of the Jedi comics were being set. So, so I, was, I was sent the comics and told, you've got you to gotta set it within this, uh, this timeline and within, within these sort of parameters set up in the comics. So there was no faster than light travel. It was all taking place within one star system. So it was like a Star Wars story taking place within the solar system and all various planets are inhabited and asteroids are inhabited. So I, I had a couple of chats with the comic creators and, uh, and my editor at, at um, Lucas Books um, but I, it was, they're all my characters in that. I think there are a couple of characters in my novel, which appear in the comics, but my main characters are all my own, like Lenore and Tresana. They're all my own characters that I made up and the story's my own. Um, I seem to remember the first few ideas I had, uh, I sent in and they said, no, can't touch that because we've got plans for this in the comics and no, can't touch this. So I stepped back a bit and just made up a... <laughs> You know, a sort of sci-fi story that, that would would sit in, um, or space fantasy story that, that would sit in their, their universe that they created. So I sort of took a step back, really, and wrote my own adventure story featuring, you know, set in that in that world. So when a you know, Tython is something that let's see, by tw his novel came out in 2013, so you're writing in 2012. So a lot of us had seen Tython in like uh, the Old Republic, where they had shown us Tython, and I think maybe those Kevin Anderson comics in the '90s, the the, the old Jedi Sith ones. Did you uh, what what references or material did they give you, or did they refer you to to help get at least some sort of information for an era they've never they've never touched at all? Well, it was it. it was just like I say, the Dawn of the Jedi comics, which were written by John Ostrander and uh somebody else um and that was it really it was they i think they sent me a bit of a bible a sort of a dawn of the jedi bible but they were a current series of comics which i assume aren't, aren't going on anymore i think they'd released like you know they'd released like a dozen issues by the time they asked me to write the novel so that was it i was i was not given i was not directed back to the anderson stuff or the, the old republic stuff i was just told this is tithon this is what it's all about um I think they had like a comic issue zero, which basically sets up sets up the world, uh, the worlds, you know, the the system, and the brief history of Tython system and who's you know the characters that are there or the the species that are there. Uh, so so it wasn't that restrictive, and I, I really I was really pleased about that because my my agent got in touch with me and said, "Do you want to write a Star Wars novel?" I said, "Yes," instantly, obviously, and then. Onwards from that, before I knew what it was, I was worried that it might be set right in the middle of the whole novel timeline because there's like 150 novels. And I worried about having to read <laughs> 50 novels to make sure I knew what was going on. But luckily, mine was the first one in the timeline. So that worked perfectly. So was it, uh, you know, being that it is still Star Wars, was writing something so early in the timeline where no one really knows what to expect so was it actually easier to come up with a story and write a story that still felt Star Wars in that timeline, or was it difficult in its own way because it was so early that 
there's little it's harder to tie in things that mm. people would see later i think in one way it was easier because there was no expectation and you know there was no baggage of all all the other stuff that had gone on that i had to refer back to and you know i i i even created my own uh you know my own planets and asteroids so that i could blow them up because <laughs> You can't blow up an asteroid or planet that's, that's going to be used 10,000 years hence. Um, so that side of it was easy. But the other side of it was making it a recognizable Star Wars novel. Um, and at the time, they, there was the whole thing between uh, the balance between light and dark. Whereas the Star Wars, the current Star Wars stuff we all know and love, you either you are the dark side or the light side. In The Dawn of the Jedi, the, Je the Jedi, as they were called at the time, aimed for balance between the dark side and the light side. And if you went too much to the dark side, you were shipped off to one of the moons. And if you went too too much towards the light side, you were considered sort of pro problematic. So, so the whole force thing was a little bit different. And there were no uh, there were no lightsabers. There were just force swords, which made it more of a sword and sorcery thing than uh, you know they weren't laser swords, whatever lightsabers are. They were they were metal swords. Um, so it had its problems, but it also had its uh, benefits of being set so far back. And, and there was also, you know, it, it generally was really well received, but there were, as anything like this, there's going to be fans who don't like what you do. And my my character swore a bit, not badly. She, she said bitch and bastard, I think, and people didn't like cussing in a Star Wars book. But Again, I wrote it, you know, as my own novel in the Star Wars universe. And for me, Star Wars isn't, it's not just a kid's story. It's a story for everyone. And I wanted to write about mature characters doing doing things that adults do. Um, yeah, so there, there were lots of interesting emails about, you can't use that type of droid because it didn't exist then. And I said, yes, it does, because I've just made it up, you know. <laughs> that was quite interesting, some of the fan reaction. Well, if Lucasfilm lets it, or I guess Del Rey lets it through, it, it, it's official, right? You know, well, that's they, right. They have editors for a reason. Yeah, yeah. One of the swear, you know, I think my my character called somebody a bitch, um, and the, I think the uh, uh, the line editor picked up on it, but my editor said, my editor said, no, it's it's in context. That's fine. So even words like that were brought up on. But yeah, it got through, and like you say, it's it's in the book. And I, I could say it's canon, but it isn't anymore, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's legend. Legend. It's a Star Wars legend now, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, so when it came to writing this, you mentioned how, you know, you had to back off and come up with your own story, and that led you to some more freedom. Uh, were there any things that they really wanted you to put in here them, uh, for this story, and is there anything that they used from your book in future comics or other things that they really, really liked or that they commented on that they, that they really enjoyed? Um... I, I haven't seen the future comics, so I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's possible they did carry on some of my characters or maybe some of the planets and things like that that I, I sort of made up. Um, the main thing they liked, which I was really pleased about, was my main character, Lenore Brock, who was a, sort of a, a young Jedi. Um, I don't think they were called Jedi Knights, but a young Jedi. And she was quite conflicted. She She had you know trouble in the balance and all that and they they really liked her and i they they the people doing the audiobooks actually emailed me and said it's great having to do an audiobook with a female lead because it's very rare that they they said and i don't know if this is true it's very rare that the main character in a star wars book is is a strong female character when i went into it i just thought to myself you know my main character is going to be female because i actually i really like writing strong female characters and I thought it would just, and I, at the back of my head, I thought it would be nice to have a strong, you know, a strong female Jedi instead of uh, the usual, you know, Luke Skywalker type character. So they, they like that. And I'd love to, you know, I had an idea in my head for a trilogy featuring her, but that's obviously not going to happen now due to, uh, you know, the Disney thing, I suppose. So your your book was l almost quite literally one of the last mm -hmm. novels before they did the 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 switch the timeline change did how did did that feel really weird that you put out this novel people were reading it people got the you had a pretty good response overall yeah um, 
and and then Disney basically says it's no longer canon, or by that time you had realized that it's a novel and that's how how canon can work. Were you expecting it to happen by then, or was it a surprise? No, it was a surprise. Um, it, you know, it doesn't upset me. The tie-in stuff, you, cause it, you know, it's not my, I don't own it. It's not my property. It's copyright Lucas books or Lucas film. Same as the 30 Days of Night stuff, even though they're original novels that I, you know, they're my stories. I don't own the characters. I don't own the novel. And that's, you know that going into a tie-in thing. You paid you paid whatever you paid to do something that isn't going to be yours. Although your name's on the cover and, you know, you get, I, I've got loads of emails from people and I still get emails now from people reading Dawn of the Jedi. And generally, you know, 99% of the emails I get are people who've enjoyed it. Just um, And like you say, it was pretty well received generally. I quite like the reception. There were, there were those who hated it and there were those who really loved it. And it's, I think it's in Omni's top 10 Star Wars books, which is really um, top 10 or top 20, which is really gratifying. But, you know, these things happen and, and it's, uh, it's not my universe. It's not my timeline. And it, it's a bit of a shame that it's been sort of sidelined, mainly because, I, like I said, I'd have loved to have written more. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to write another Star Wars novel now. But we'll see. You know, the, my name's in the hat, as it were. So we'll see what happens. Well, you, you did write recently, so they, they do tend to use people they know yeah. who can write in the universe. So that, that definitely helps. But you went straight from Star Wars to a, to, to Alien. Mm. Um, was Alien, since you tend to write more horror, uh, was Alien more of your... Uh, cup of tea or more in your comfort zone when it came to writing or were you such a big fan of Star Wars that writing Star Wars was just its own great thing as it is? Well yeah Star Wars was a lot of fun I, w I was much bigger fan of Alien um, probably because it's more it's darker I mean my stuff's pretty dark generally my you know my, my thrillers grim <laughs> my my uh, horror novels are quite dark and my, fan my I've written some fantasy novels I wouldn't call them heroic fantasy. I call them really, really, really dark fantasy. Five or six of those. So the alien thing was more... I, I, I wanted to write an alien novel for years since before I, I'd started doing any tie-in work. And, I mean, the tie-in work's only... I, I try to do... limit myself to not doing too much tie-in work because I'd always... I always prefer writing my own my own fiction, really. But the tie-in work's fun. And, uh, you know, I'm a working writer and I, I'm making a living. Um, and it also, the Star Wars stuff and the Alien stuff opened, uh, opened up my name to people who wouldn't have read me before. And there's not, I don't think there's a huge crossover. I mean, Star Wars sold really well. And it, I was on New York Times bestseller list with it, which I think every Star Wars novel probably gets there. Um, which means, you know, I don't know how many it sold, but tens of thousands. And there's no, there's not a huge crossover, but... There are lots of people who read the Star Wars book who've con contacted me and asked me what else I've done. So obviously I point them towards my website and, and see what happens. But Alien was, you know, probably 15, 12, 15 years ago, I pitched an Alien novel to Dark Horse when they were doing them. And then they, I think they stopped just as I was pitching an idea to them. Um, so that was a really, you know, dream come true writing the first Alien book. It was great. Really good fun. And getting to write Ripley as well, you know, that was problems aside with how I resolved the story and how I had to try and resolve it. That that was, it was really good fun writing her. So writing, you know, like Alien Out of Shadows and so on, uh, what was the reception of your Alien books from the Alien fans? Because we know the Alien franchise is a franchise which, if you just have a casual viewer just looking in, it's kind of strange because you have two movies which everyone says is great, mm. and then people tend to just poop on everything else that's ever come out. Yeah. And then there's some comics that people like, except for the last one. People are really divided on the Alien franchise. The only franchise I know where people literally say they like like half of it. Yeah. But they still love Alien franchise and they'll still go. So what was the reception, or what were the fans like when you stepped into that franchise? Um, it was, it was mixed. I think to be to be fair, um, I think I wrote a pretty solid alien action novel given the constraints i had um it was it was part of a trilogy that was me and chris golden and jim moore we wrote a novel each and the trilogy concept was presented us by fox and titan who commissioned us to write the book but it all came from fox really i think fox from memory sent us like two pages and in those two pages there was you know a couple of paragraphs on each novel 
that we had to sort of stick to. And I got the first one, which was, you know, out of the shadows between alien and aliens. And it had to feature Ripley waking up uh, from cryo sleep and having an alien adventure. So, so there, there was that constraint. Um, some people, you know, like, like any, like any thing like this, um, you get the fans, some love it and some really hate it. And so much yes, oh yeah, it was okay. You know, it could have been better, it could have been worse. Um, I think with the the Rage War trilogy I'm writing now, which is sort of more distant future, that's the, the it's three books. The first one's Predator, the second one's Alien, third one's Alien versus Predator, because of licensing. But really, it's it's one big story featuring aliens and predators, one big overarching huge space military sci-fi thing that does not involve pregnant ladies being imbued with a weird freaky alien hybrid thing no that's not happening no (laughs) (laughs) that was terrible that was terrible (laughs) well yeah that was very yeah yeah i was look i was pleased i was told to stay away from there because you know there's the second one coming up you know one, one thing that surprised a lot of people in 2012 was you know ridley scott finally decided to delve back into that universe even though for the what years before you was like yes, it's kind of maybe sort of involved cousin second brother maybe you know but when Prometheus came out did it hurt or help when it came to writing in the alien universe? Um, it, it's difficult for me to view Prometheus as an alien film or even even you know even a film set in the alien universe. I I think if he'd made a standalone film, I'd probably be more of a fan of it. Um, I don't know, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think Prometheus presents so many missed opportunities, but it also looks wonderful, but it doesn't make any sense in my head. My wife loves it, and she'll watch it again and again, and I say, so what happens in it? And she says, I'm not quite sure, but it looks great. Uh, you know, my hope is Prometheus 2, which seems to be as time goes by is more and more an alien film it seems that yeah. Cam- alien covenant is what it's called oh right? that's right alien covenant yeah yeah so you know <laughs> he's he's wearing his uh his uh history on his sleeve now ridley so let's hope and it doesn't involve the doctor now does it? the um I, I read recently that uh the android um what's his name yeah the androids in it. michael fassbender's character. yeah fassbender's in it but the um marianne the doctor isn't in it anymore so don't know what's going to happen there maybe people can learn to turn sideways when donuts are yeah absolutely yeah (laughs) (laughs) that and many other scenes like take your helmet off in an alien environment yeah but um (laughs) so yeah you know it, it didn't it didn't it wasn't in my head while i was writing my alien books prometheus partly because it was an ongoing franchise well you know alien might be an ongoing franchise now with alien 5 but um aside from that it, it just it didn't feature in my thought process while i was writing the books really um although fans have seen you know i, I came up with a ancient alien race the sort of dog-faced aliens and lots of fans some fans have read that and said oh my god that's he's referring to the things on the wall in prometheus and i i didn't even think about that i just you know it just these came out of the blue these these different forms of aliens so I, I may have linked them unintentionally. So uh, you, you mentioned how Prometheus wasn't something that really connected. Did the, uh, I think it's 2010, Predator film connect with or help you write anything else? Since there hasn't really been as many Predator anything as there has been Alien. No, there hasn't. And that, um, yeah, the, the Predators are easier to write for me because... I, you know, it's sort of obvious what they are. They're warriors, and you know that. That I think there have been, I think there have been previous predator novels and comics and things like that where their society is explored a bit more. And I, in my book, I I do make up a lot of stuff. And the exciting stuff is, I'm my books are canon, so the stuff that gets out there on the shelf after I've written the book becomes canon. That's that's a bit weird, actually. It's quite exciting. But yeah, I, I I found the Predators good fun to write actually. Um, although, you know, again, fan reaction is oh, Levin's Predators are too easy to kill. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think you'll ever. There's such 
dedicated fan bases for Alien and Predator, not so much, maybe, but Alien and Star Wars. And, you know, I've got friends who've written Doctor Who novels and they've had tough times from fans, even though they're fans themselves. It's difficult to please everyone because everyone's got their expectation of what, what the next Alien book should be. But like I say, you know, like we've said, I just go out there and try and write my version of what an Alien novel is going to be or Predator novel. And really, as long as most people enjoy it, you've done pretty good. Cause it's, yeah. I don't think it's impossible. To, I don't think it's even possible to please everyone. It's even if the book is like the best possible book someone could have written and it was perfect in canon, someone's going to dislike it. Well, they are, yeah, and that's a, that's only natural. And it's the same with any, you know, my original stuff. I, um, I don't, I've, I've not written anything that's universally loved because that's like you say, it's impossible. And I also think. If you do, you know, if I did write an alien book that every alien fan loved, it probably would be, it wouldn't be that original. I don't think, I think it would probably be, um, I don't want to write something that everyone's expecting because that doesn't excite me really. Because in my, in my writing process, I, I like getting to the end of writing the book because I want to know what happens. So if I can fool myself and um, entertain myself in writing a book, I'm hoping that entertains, you know, the readers and the fans. So uh, one last franchise I just want to touch on because this is a franchise which most people know because of Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. And uh, of course I'm referring to Hellboy, which you've written mm -hmm. several several books into. Um, was the Hellboy franchise easier to write into as far as like uh, appeasing the fans and getting them happy? Because it's uh, until uh, Dark Horse let del Toro make those movies, which he needs to make a third one really mm -hmm. soon. He does. Um, he, uh, it, it's not really something that most people know. Like it, it's been around for a while, and Dark Horse, you know, it's made money off it, but it's not really like a name that everyone knew. Was it was it easier to delve into something that is not known by every person on the planet in some way or another? Um, do you know, it, it's interesting because it wasn't actually known by me. This is an interesting one. Uh, Chris Golden, who I'm really good friends with now, and Chris and I have written, uh, God, seven or eight novels together and a screenplay, and you know, we're We've just written another novella together. Um, he approached me. He was editing an anthology called uh, Odd, Odder Jobs. It was the second Hellboy short story anthology. I think he was doing it for Dark Horse. Um, and he asked me to write a story out of the blue. He, and I remember his email. He said, hey, we, we, we don't know each other. We've, we walk past each other in conventions probably, but do you want to write a, a Hellboy short story? And I thought about it and then wrote back and said, I'd feel like a fraud because I've not read the comics. So, no. And then he, he got back to me and said, I want you to write a Hellboy story. You've got to read the comics and then write me a story. So um, he sent me, or Dark Horse sent me the comics, up, you know, up to the time. And I absolutely loved them and wrote a short story, which, you know, I'm really still really pleased with now. And from that, ended up writing uh, the two novels that I've written. And they were... A, you know, total pleasure to write, and I, I don't remember any sort of editorial problems with them, apart from, because obviously it goes, um, Mike Mignola gets to, I don't know if he reads them all, but he gets to approve, you know, uh, treatments and things. And the only note I had on the first one was, um, Hellboy doesn't have a prehensile tail, which <laughs> I, I think I had him swinging from rafters with his tail, and that was the only note. So considering my first Hellboy novel was a really big scale worldwide thing uh, which you know exposed him and it's a public view and all that it, mike was really really good about it okay so uh we're gonna begin wrapping up we have three should be fairly quick uh listener questions okay the first one is you know you write horror and you've already mentioned earlier in this interview that you know it, it, that's it, you get the dark out in the book and yeah. that way you're pretty light and, and good hearted and that's uh, and that's true for a lot of things uh, the people who comedians tend to have the darkest lives mm, yeah yeah um, but this wants to know, you like writing horror, so what scares you? Ooh, um, pretty bad things happening to the people I love, really, I think. Um, my writing changed a lot when I became a father, and I still now, I mean, my kids are uh, 12 and 17, and I still write about families in peril. That's, that's probably the heart of, you know, if I had any topic that I go back to again and again, it's about families and kids in in peril i mean you know the traditional stuff doesn't scare me like don't like spiders very much but they don't scare me and you know monsters don't scare me and ghosts don't scare me because i i don't yeah, 
you know, a lot of horror readers won't like to hear it, but I don't really believe in the supernatural. I think if there's, I think there's a lot of stuff we don't know about, but if it exists, it's not supernatural, it's natural, and we just don't know about it yet. So if, you know, there may be ghosts, ghosts might exist. I've never really seen one myself, but if they do exist, it's because nature allows it. So, um, yeah, the, the stuff that scares me is the really personal stuff, the, the stuff that's close to me and close to home, like family and friends. Okay. And cl so then, clowns as well. Oh, <laughs> clowns are terrifying. <laughs> really terrifying. <laughs> Um, that's why I don't watch American Horror Story once they went to the big show. Yeah. So this next one is, um, over time you've optioned off some of your stories to be made into movies, and as of now, I don't believe any of them have actually been made into movies yet. How does that process work for a writer of a book who's optioning off stuff to movies? Do you, get, do you just get paid up front, and if they use it or not, or do you get paid if they make it into a movie? How does that process work as an author? Um, well, firstly, I did. I had a film made last year, actually, with Nicolas Cage in it. It was called Pay the Ghost. That was out. Uh, that was last Halloween. So that was my first. Okay. That's my first and only so far. Which, um, and you know, I was really pleased with it. Uh, Nicolas Cage has made some uh, some good films and some bad films, shall we say? And I think, in the scheme of things, this was a pretty good. You know, it was a he he, he did a great performance in it. I think he's a great actor when he puts his mind to it. Um. I was really pleased with it. Process-wise, it's different every time. I mean, that's the only one I've had made. Um, I've had, I've probably had about 15 or 20 options, I suppose. And they, they range from, hey, you can have a free option on your story for a year to his, you know, studio saying, here's a bunch of money, we're going to make you, make your book into a film, and then they don't. Uh, the, the process generally is an option, uh, a producer or a studio or a writer will option your story and what, what that means is they've bought the option to buy the rights or they reserve the option to buy the rights so they'll give you um x amount of money for a year and what that means is they've then got exclusive right to develop that that project into a movie and if uh if they then get to the stage where they're going to make the movie you you get the proper money on the first day of photography the first day of principal photography and that's that proper money is then actually buying the rights. So options can be any amount, you know, from a handshake to, you know, I've heard of million dollar options, although, you know, I'm obviously never had a sniff of one of those. But actually buying the rights is um, they only buy the rights if they're actually on the verge of making the film. So there's always lots of excitement. You know, something gets optioned and some and, and uh, the producer says, oh, this is definitely going to be made. Definitely. And then it all goes quiet and you don't hear anything for years and then it dies a death or like with pay the ghost it just pops up again with a new a new studio and they say oh we've got the rights for this nicholas cage is in it and we're going to make it so it's all very every, every option i've had is all worked out differently and processes are all different all very slow unfortunately okay and uh, the last question is one that we, well, it's a variation of what we always ask everyone. So we're going to give you the soapbox now to promote anything that you have coming out soon. Um, your website, uh, people can uh, contact, uh, stock, uh, find you. Um, yeah, any upcoming appearances you might have in conventions. We know the summer is coming quickly. Um, you know, any anything you have coming up, um, we're going to be the soapbox to promote whatever you'd like to promote to the listeners. Okay, sure, yeah. Well, um, the website's www.timleben.net uh, you can get me on Twitter at Tim Leben Facebook less frequent I mean I've come off Facebook because I was I was getting a bit bored with it and it, it's, it's a bit of a time sink uh, I do still have a Facebook page and I pop back on I usually pop on at the weekend just to see what's going on but I have my fill of cat pictures and, and Star Wars memes or whatever so um as for forthcoming books, the Rage War books from Titan, the first one's out, the second one, uh, Alien Invasion, that's out April, I believe. I'm still writing the third one, which is AVP Armageddon, and that's out in, I think it's November. Um, and then August this year, my second thriller, The Family Man, is out. That's only in the UK at the moment. We didn't um, haven't sold it in the US yet. Um, and then other than that, I've got I've actually got a trilogy of sort of horror dark fantasy novels from titan but that's uh that's a bit in the future I, although i've written it and delivered it the first one's not out until april 2017 and that's called relics 
So everyone would have forgotten about that by the time it comes out, but hopefully they'll be reminded. <laughs> uh, and that, that's it, I guess. I've got a few film things ticking over, uh, but nothing, you know, nothing that's going to hit the screens in the immediate future, I don't think. But there's always hope. There always is. <laughs> so uh, last thing I have is just a, a request, because uh, we like to... Uh, continue promoting interviews after they've happened and before they've happened, um, just so that you know we can send people back to them. Yeah. Um, so if you could record a bumper, just something along the lines of you know, hey, this is Tim Levin. I'm the writer of, insert some of your books, and you can listen to me on Bombad Radio. Okay, sure. Hi, oh, it's Tim Levin here. I'm the author of The Silence and The Hunt, and a variety of alien and predator novels. And you can listen to me on Bombad Radio. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your your evening. Yeah, and you. Thanks a lot. Cheers, and take care. Thank you.